Good morning. Welcome to worship. Would you please read with me Psalm 118, verses 14 to 29. The Lord is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. I will give thanks for you are my salvation. Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and firm foundation for life. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Would you please stand and let's tell of the greatness of our God as we sing How Great Thou Art.
great and mighty God, creator of the universe, you made the world in beauty and you are restoring all things through the victory of Jesus, our Saviour and King. We pray that wherever your image is still disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war and greed, that the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love and peace to the glory of your name. Thank you that Jesus is a firm foundation, even as we move through every uncertainty, sorrow and trial of this life. We celebrate your presence with us today, and inspired, we look forward to the final morning, when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life, and forever freed to be your people. Amen. heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty of the Lord? Forever he will be the lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee and worship him alone.
going to sing this song and lead us into a time of prayer where we come before our good God and we bring him the concerns of our hearts this morning. Some of us want to bring praise and adoration to God this morning for all he has done for us. Well, lift your voice and pray. Some of us have concerns and worries on our hearts. We'll bring those. Our good God can handle those as well. But let's, let's sing to, together this song of worship as we come into the throne room of God this morning. we thank you this morning for the hope that we have because we know that our saviour is raised from the dead and is alive today lord we think of how that hope applies to our life today even while we move through uncertain days even when we face illness when we face challenges and suffering Lord, we think of those in our congregation, our church family, Lord, that are facing challenging days. Lord, those that are still on the journey of recovery from illness. We think of um, Des and Joy as they face um, a surgery this week. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. That we can know your comfort and your presence. Lord, we think of our uh, families that are grieving loss. Lord, we know that your comfort is not just for a day. Your mercies are new every morning. You are strong for us every day. And so, Lord, we choose to lean on you, our Saviour and our King. Lord, as we head out into our community tomorrow, Lord, we go as people with good news to our community that are reeling th- through the, all the uncertainties of these last few years. We declare that we are not immune to uncertainty, but we do have a sure foundation, that you, Jesus, are our rock. You are our certain hope. Lord, Let us show your love and reveal your presence in all our actions this week, we pray. Amen. John chapter 20. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Have you ever been the victim of a bad rap? I'm not talking about the dancing, the other kind. I can't say that this has been much of a problem for me, but once or twice, I believe I've been misunderstood or taken the wrong way. Occasionally, people have decided that I am a certain thing when I know that I'm not, or at least I think I can be more than they say, given a chance. And I don't think it's fair when this happens. I want to fix it, to clear my name. I think most people would want to do that. Thomas the Apostle was given a bad rap. For centuries, people all over the world have labelled him for something he once said. And I bet you've heard of him as doubting Thomas. You know, I'm certain this isn't fair. Thomas is more than that. Jesus made him more. It It began on the first Easter Sunday... Last week was our Easter Sunday, and we heard the thrilling story of when Mary, Peter, and John each encountered the risen Jesus. Their leader, teacher, friend, Messiah, had conquered death, and they realized that Jesus was the greatest person who ever lived. Now the first part of today's Bible reading is another recount from that same day. And we can assume that Mary, Peter and John had done exactly what Jesus asked of them and told the other apostles about what they'd seen and they'd all gathered together that evening in some room in Jerusalem, safe behind locked doors. I can only imagine the intense interrogation that those three received that night because I know if I'd been there, I'd have had a hundred questions and I'm still hungry for details. The vibe that night must have been something else a mixture of excitement, confusion, hope and scepticism. Emotional, for sure. When Jesus appeared in the room, I wonder if the disciples recognised him there. I deduced from other accounts that there was something, something about Jesus' risen state that made him somewhat different. Perhaps those disciples were frightened They were in fact at that moment hiding from the Jewish authorities who were putting great effort into silencing the the Jesus movement. And they had just carried out Jesus' execution. And the story of Saul proves that their lust for violence was not yet quenched. What if they thought that Jesus was one of them? That he'd broken in and heard all their Jesus talk? If that were my train of thought, I'd have been rather terrified. And on the other hand, what if they did recognise Jesus but considered him a ghost? He had recently died after all and he'd somehow entered a locked room. In Luke 26, the disciples thought that Jesus was a ghost and they were understandably horrified. And I know that I'm not comfortable with meeting a ghost. (laughs) We'll never know for sure, but I expect that the disciples were indeed experiencing some fear and distress because Jesus' words for them were, Peace be with you. The experts tell us that this greeting was actually very common in Jewish culture. It was just like saying, hi, how are you? But that being said, I am learning more and more that the gospel gospel writers were intentional with their word choices. And I don't believe that John would waste ink on a throwaway phrase. Rather, this greeting was rich with meaning. Jesus was meeting the disciples where they were at. They were afraid, confused, sceptical. Jesus came so they could experience peace. He offered them peace of mind. 
because he definitely wasn't anything bad, not a ghost, not a murderer, but in fact their beloved Jesus. And I expect they now remembered the time recorded in John 14 when Jesus told them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. My peace I leave you, my peace I give you. And he provided them with peace because he was indeed the Messiah that they'd hoped for. Isaiah 9, 6 is just one prophecy among so many that referred to the Messiah as a bringer of peace. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Most wonderful of all, Jesus offered peace because his sacrifice had brought about reconciliation. He'd, he'd united his disciples with God and now they'd received the greatest treasure, that is peace with God and a place in God's family. Now they were his brothers. So Jesus offered peace, but it wasn't until he showed his wounds that this peace was fully realised and the disciples were overjoyed finally able to celebrate together. They needed the full evidence in order to believe entirely, and rightfully so. I don't think that God expected anything less. Then John records the fairy tale like event, when Jesus breathed the Holy, the Holy Spirit on the disciples, perhaps like Aslan the lion in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, who breathed life into the cursed statue creatures. I picture Aslan, but I should be recalling a more ancient story, that of God in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 2.7, we learn that the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living thing. John gave this ending away at the beginning of his book. In there... In Jesus there was life, and that life was the light of the world. Jesus, the new Adam, was recreating this world, setting it right, starting with his friends. Jesus finished his encounter with ascending. We know that he came so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but re receive eternal life. And now we see a deputization. The disciples were expected to carry out Jesus' work in his absence. The gift he'd just given them would resource them to achieve the task of spreading the gospel, offering people the opportunity to choose him, to believe in him, and therefore receive forgiveness of sins. And this brings us to Thomas. He was absent on Easter Sunday night for some reason, and we might assume that he was choosing to spend time alone trying to make sense of the current events, but there could have been other reasons someone sick, an emergency, maybe even a miscommunication. And we know that the group had given Thomas that same message Mary Magdalene gave them, I've seen the Lord. However, Thomas was not ready to believe. The man had doubts. There, I said it. But I still don't think he deserved to be labelled the doubter. Let's consider some of the other New Testament characters. There's Peter, who is remembered as the head of the church, and not the denier of Christ. There's John, the one that Jesus loved, not vengeful John, even though he once urged Jesus to um, call down heavenly fire on a whole Samaritan town. And what about Paul? He gets to be known as Paul the Apostle or Saint Paul, and we don't plague him with the title Saul the Christian Slayer, and consider that apart from this one time, we don't usually see Thomas acting sceptical. To the contrary, one of the few biblical references to Thomas occurs when Jesus wanted to go back to, to, Judah, to Judah for Lazarus, but the disciples were reluctant because of recent death threats. And in this moment, Thomas had proposed, let us go with him so that we may die also. And so perhaps Thomas the Doubter should be better remembered as Thomas the Brave. That is a better rap. Some people criticise Thomas for the gory conditions that he set, unless I see the nail marks, etc. But there's no reason to assume that Thomas literally desired to shove his hand into a bloody wound. I mean, that's just gross. Perhaps he was speaking dramatically as he had in the past let us die with him, kind of thing. If this were the case, and I truly suspect so, 
Thomas was only requesting to receive, to receive the same proof that Jesus, the same proof of Jesus that the disciples had already received. And Jesus only kept him waiting for one week. It was the Sunday after Easter when Jesus came to Thomas. So, like today, the week after Easter. And fun fact, one of the main reasons the church worships on a Sunday and not a Saturday, which is the original Sabbath, is because the resurrected Jesus appeared so frequently on this day. The disciples were back in the same room with the doors locked again and Jesus somehow passed through the walls again and this time Jesus approached just the one disciple, Thomas, and he met him exactly where he was at. He gave Thomas the opportunity to receive his peace just like the others and Jesus showed knowledge of Thomas's questions, his conditions. He showed his hands, his wounds. And perhaps he wore a teasing smile as he invited him to touch. And Thomas proved he really wasn't a sadist. Jesus' presence was more than enough. And even though Jesus didn't breathe like Aslan this time, Thomas proved that he had already received the Holy Spirit. It wasn't about the molecules or the condensation. Thomas was divinely inspired as he made his highly profound confession of Jesus. My Lord and my God. Thomas understood and he believed perfectly. And Jesus told Thomas that he was blessed because he'd seen and then believed. And Jesus then said that there would be others who would be blessed as they'd believe without seeing him. And my friends, we are among those who... Among, we're among those whom Jesus was speaking. We've never seen Jesus in the flesh like Thomas did. But like him, we too can understand who Jesus is. We also are compelled to believe and to call Jesus our Lord and our God. Some of you may have noticed that this week there have been some people in our Facebook page making comments demonstrating that they don't want to believe in Jesus. They just want to push him away. We should know that this wasn't the case with Thomas. He wanted to believe, but he had questions. And the story of brave Thomas, who sometimes had doubts, helps us all to know that God is gracious and he goes out of his way to make faith possible. Friends, it is not a sin to doubt When you become a Christian, your questions don't necessarily all go away. We don't need to be panicked by uncertainty. God is more than willing to meet us where we're at, like he did for Thomas. And consider that the sharing of Jesus' spirit on Easter Sunday was the beginning of a process. It brought change for all the disciples, but Pentecost was still to come. And this day would bring even greater changes for the entire world. We are here as a result of that miraculous outpouring of the Spirit. But it's still not all. The best is yet to come. One day, like Thomas, we'll see Jesus face to face. And all the mysteries of God will be erased and we'll receive all the knowledge and perfect peace it is coming my friends and until then I urge you to seek him for your answers nobody's going to label you or give you a bad rap Jesus loves you he listens to your questions seek him always and you will see that he goes out of his way to make your faith possible and when he does may you find great joy in encountering him your Lord and your God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We've come together as the people of God and we've brought the challenges and concerns of our hearts with us this morning. And we've come to meet with our risen Saviour. And we're going to respond a little differently this morning. One of the big features when Thomas met his risen Saviour was that he received the peace of Christ. 
he still had questions, no doubt, about how everything worked and what. Uh, but in the presence of his Saviour, the presence of his Saviour was enough for him in that moment. And Jesus said, peace be with you. This morning as we come and dwell in the presence of God, with all the challenges and things going on in our life, Jesus comes and meets us this morning in his, with his presence and says, my peace I give you. Peace be with you. And I invite you to stand up and share that peace with somebody else around you. Peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Experience in the presence of God and in the presence of his family here this morning, the peace of Christ. I've been encouraged this morning that we can come to God with our questions. Doubts don't disqualify us, but as the Spirit empowers us today, there are some things that don't need to be uncertain. We have solid ground to stand on. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. We can know that we belong to Jesus. We can know that Jesus is with us by the power of his Holy Spirit. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Let's sing together our sending song. benediction this morning do not be afraid for I have redeemed you I have called you by your name you are mine when you go through deep waters and great trouble I will be with you when you go through rivers of difficulty you will not drown when you walk through the fire of oppression you will not be burned the flames will not consume you for I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel your Saviour Go out in peace to love and serve our Lord. Amen.